Hello everybody, James Blake here, former ATP Tour player and longtime Travis Matthew ambassador. Here with a newer Travis Matthew ambassador, Lee Elder, the first African American to play in the Masters. Multiple PGA Tour wins on your career. Thank you so much for being here, Lee. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you, sir. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be asked to come and, and to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about my page. Yeah. And it's just so, such a great time for me to really enjoy and meet all of you guys here at Travis Matthews because it's certainly something that I plan to uh, be involved in for as long as you fellas feel that I'm a, I'm a good ambassador for you. Well, thank you. And uh, I mean, let's let's talk about your past. I'm, I'm going to take it all the way back to the beginning. Born in Dallas in 1934 um, and then moved to L.A. I'd, I'd love to hear your uh, your opinion on the, the contrast between Dallas and L.A. And, and what a difference that made in your life. Well, the move was certainly one that certainly was one that I felt that helped me and helped me progress in my career. Living in Dallas, being born there, not having the chance to really uh, play a lot of the golf courses and participate in a lot of the golf tournament that was being played at that time. You know, back in back in the early days in Dallas, man, you could we could only play one golf course and we could only play that on Monday. So I think that. Uh, to, uh, I hate to hate to say that the uh, the problem that uh, we had uh, there in Dallas was really not a one that was uh, that was really one that was that a person could really enjoy. So I felt that by by moving from Dallas to Los Angeles, well, it was not my decision to make that move. I lost my parents when I was at an early age, when I was nine years of age, and. And I stayed in the Dallas area uh, a little bit longer because I I watched my brother go to the golf course, and that's how I got started in, in golf at Tennyson Park in Dallas, Texas. So I'd follow him. I'd watch him come home at night and put a lot of money on the, that he had made at the golf course on the table to help with the households and everything. And I decided that, hey, I want to I wanna go. But when I tried to... When I tried to go at age 10 uh, to, to caddy, uh, the pro at the close wouldn't let me caddy because they had, they had a, a way of saying that the younger kids seem to get in more trouble because they're more playful, still more playful. So you had to be at least 12 in order to caddy at, at Tennyson Park. So for those next couple of years, I kind of sh shagged. Uh, I was the official shagger for the pro uh, there at Tennyson Park, Irvin Hardwick, who uh, uh, were the, were the, gave all the lessons. So it was, a, it was a good thing for me because it gave me a chance to, to make a few dollars each day and then to get, become familiar with the game of golf. But my brother, was Raymond, was always one that had always said, uh, uh, you too small to to, to caddy anyway, <laughs> but I think it finally I finally proved to him that I that I could caddy. And after a couple uh, after a few years of growing up and going through the same thing and the same routine, it got kind of tiresome. Mm -hmm. So my aunt Aunt Helen carried me to Wichita Falls, Texas, which is was a short distance from Dallas. Uh, so I went and lived with her, being the youngest of of all of the kids, it uh, it made it so that uh, I could uh, wouldn't have to really get out and do a lot of the hard chores that we had to do around the house. But then she was engaged to a fellow that was a a runner on the train from from Texas to California, and he lived in California. So she took me, and we moved to California. By that time, now I was <laughs> I was fifteen. And I really was happy that it had happened. But then I went back uh, before I really got situated out there very well to give them a chance to, to get themselves together. And so after about going back to Dallas at around 15 and 16, I went back to California in 17 with her. And I stayed there from the time I was 17 up until I... Uh, uh, start playing and look really looking at trying to work at become involved in the game of golf and which I did but I I really didn't 
become that well involved in it until I met a fellow by the name of Ted Rose. I was I was cat I was still catting and playing at Western Golf Course in Gardenia, which was about uh, about a 20 minute ride from my home uh, near the Coliseum to to <clears throat> to the Western Golf Club, and so that's how I really got started in in the game. But I met him, and he took me on his wing and and uh, just and gave me so much knowledge about the game that I didn't know about. And that's really how I got started in the game of golf. And then when you did get started, let's uh, let's get into your career. You immediately won 18 out of uh, out of 22 on the UGA, uh, which is an unbelievable record at any level. And did you believe that winning on that tour was going to lead to the to the PGA Tour? Well, it 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 it, it helped me get to the PGA <laughs> Tour by and what I mean by that is that I was able to accomplish the type of money that it took for me to go to the PGA Tour. Mm -hmm. By winning those tournaments, and that was in 1966 that I accomplished that. As a matter of fact, that was my first year also of playing in the USO at, uh, at the Olympic Field. Mm -hmm. I played the first two rounds with Johnny Miller, who was also a youngster coming up at that time. Mm -hmm. And after that, I think what really had happened was the fact that I had been working so hard and talking and running around all over the country trying to find sponsors uh, to so I could go on the tour, but you know, not being <laughs> well noticed, well well known rather, that uh, no one is just going to automatically pick you up and and give you X amount of dollars to go out and play on the tour. So I decided that I would. I had played the UGA tour, but I hadn't had. I just had moderate success mm -hmm. in it. But I had. I decided that this was going to be the way that I would make that that <clears throat> that transfer from the UGA Tour to the PGA Tour by playing the USJ by playing the UGA Tour regular, mm -hmm. which I did. We played every place, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. Uh, but you know, the thing about it is uh, California only had, on the UGA Tour, only had two golf tournaments the whole time that the UGA Tour was in, in, in existence. On the two that, uh, that was actually out here, we played in Hesperia, and we played in uh, Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. And also, well, it was a situation to where you had to do something in order to keep trying to get from back east to here was pretty tough. So I decided that, well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe maybe try to make a living in the Midwest where I could be in an, an area t to where I could go pretty quick, easily from a certain point to all of the places that were pretty easy to get to. So I decided to uh, make that make that home in Washington, D.C., in which I did. I was there for 23 years. I had uh, Langston Golf Course there, uh, and I decided that, well, since I'm, <coughs> excuse me, since I'm on the tour, I'm going to make it's a, it's a point to where I can get from one place to the other very easily because the I could hop on a plane and go to almost any place in the United States and even uh, 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 at farm. But mm -hmm. so I decided that I'd, I'd do that and stay there and work at that. And and that's where the success of, of the elder first began. Yeah, that, that started quite a career. And in that first year, first year on the PGA Tour, you, uh, you stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jack Nicklaus that was in a playoff with him. How, what were the emotions like in your first year playing against uh, one of the greats of all time? Well, it was, <laughs> it was nerve-wracking. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why it was nerve-wracking because I had read so much about the great Jack Nicklaus. And, mm -hmm. and here I am. And, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Murray, a great sports writer uh, in the Los Angeles area, wrote an article where he says, you know, it was so wonderful seeing a young <clears throat> minority player battle the great Jack Nicklaus with his alpacas and his wonderful clothing that he had on. Mm -hmm. And this young man with a, a public link visor on, <laughs> giving, the, giving the great Jack Nicklaus the, the run of his life. Yeah. I, I really think that made me realize that I had played five holes with the great Jack Nicklaus that I felt that I could really play on this tour and have have some good success. I had a, I had pretty much dominated the UGA because mm -hmm. I think the reason why that worked was because 
I had now been tutored by probably one of the greatest golfers in the, in the world. He just happened to be black and didn't have the chance to show his skill at that particular time. But good, fortunate for me that he were at an age to where he was not going to continue his career, and he decided that he would, he would uh, spend his time with trying to uh, get me involved in the game. So that same year that you were battling with Jack Milkis is the same year that Arthur Ashe won uh, won the U.S. Open in 1968. So I, w I was wondering if you had any sort of relationship with him, as you two were both blazing trails in the two white country club sports. Well, I knew Arthur. I knew him in Washington D.C. His career was fantastic, and I, uh, you know, he's it certainly it certainly gave me a chance to uh, to work and look at the situation that he was going through mm -hmm. and kind of follow the things that he was doing to try to get my career jump started in the correct in the correct way. Mm -hmm. I uh, I really watched him an awful lot and especially playing that Dry Creek Park where it was not too far from, from my house. I lived mm -hmm. at 16th and Taylor, so it gave me a chance to go and see him when he was out playing in the area. Uh, and I would have loved to have patterned my career after Arthur Ashe, but it was just that his his career, I mean, his in, his involvement in the game of tennis were so far-reaching than mine on the tour, so I just kind of sat back and just kind of took an example of it. I, uh, I hope that uh, in some way that the things that he did really helped me progress in my career. Well, I'll, I'll speak for myself. You guys are both inspirations to me, so I, I appreciate what you did in your sport and what, what he did in, in my sport of tennis. But um, you were able to then play in, in South Africa in 1971. Um, how, how was that um, experience, and how did the, the invitation from Gary Player really come about? Well, Gary and I was playing in, uh, uh, in, the, in the PGA. No, it was the, it was the USO, Toledo, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about it, and Gary had been asking me about, uh, you know, he, call, he calls everybody, Laddie, Laddie, I need you to really think seriously about what we had talked about. Well, what we had talked about was me coming to South Africa. He said, well, it's going to be a difficult situation for you, you know, so I said, well, I, I want you to think about it and see if you want to, if you would like to take this, uh, take that step. I said, uh, Gary, I would be more than happy. Two, I think right now what we have to do is we have to work on trying to get a visa for me to come to South Africa. He said, well, we'll work on that, laddie. Uh, and it took me, we made application for it. I went to the U.S. State Department here in the United States, made application. He made the application in South Africa through Prime Minister Borster, who was, oh, man, was a pretty tough fella uh, to, to, to work with. He made us wait six months. Uh, before he uh, actually extended the visa to to me, uh, but what happened was the fact that when I got to South Africa, and be, but I, I, let me digress a little bit. Before I went to South Africa, I had a teacher that was at a Yonanda Seminary in Durban that had came to Washington D.C. to visit with me to tell me about <coughs> the school. That she, where she was a principal at, that they were trying to turn down because they were trying to close it because it was not up to the standard of the other school there in South Africa. So what happened after we met for about uh, oh about four or five days with my advisors and the people that was that was handling her, we decided that uh, we would try to do something to 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 help this school. So we went to the library and got the Paul's book out of the library. The Paul's book is a book that had every major American company that had affiliation in South Africa. So we wrote letters to them and went to them and visited with them to uh, ask for donation uh, so we could help get the school up to the standard that they wanted it to be. And it was great response. Yeah. We raised over 200,000 Rand wow. and got the school back up to the standard that they, ha that they wanted. And it's a, it's a hall that stands today called Lee Elder Hall in Durban, South Africa, the United wow. Seminary, that I haven't been back. Gary been saying, Daddy, you got to come over. you got to come back, and you got to see this. He said, you know, anytime you want to go back, just let me know. I'll go back with you. Oh, that's great. But it's been, uh, 
the experience that I had in South Africa was certainly good. And the reason why I was good was because I was a guest of Gary Player. Mm -hmm. And Gary Player at the time were Mr. South Africa, mm -hmm. even though the prime minister was the person that was going to uh, make this possible for me to come and play by extending me the visa. But the one thing that was disheartening was the South African players was getting receiving that springbuck color. The springbuck colors are things that we like we receive on the Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. Well, we was at it. <clears throat> we went to the dinner that night to watch them receive their their awards, and then we was in the line. And that I'm saying we. I'm talking about the people that traveled to South Africa with me, mm -hmm. which it was 12 other people that went with me. And we was in the, we was in the line where the prime minister was receiving people. It was very disappointing to see him step, <coughs> off of, step out of the line and go up on the desk and sit down one person away from reaching to shake my hand. Mm -hmm. So the paper saw that and they wrote a big article in the paper, Prime Minister Boss Sean Lee Elder. And so it was very disheartening, but it didn't yeah. it didn't break my spirit. I think that was the one thing that he wanted to do was to not have me enjoy myself there. But Gary Player and his family made sure that uh, me and the people that traveled with me had a great time. We said uh, I played in the South African Open mm -hmm. and in the South African PGA, made the cut in both of them. That's but great. the one thing that I was really happy about was I got them to extend all of the black people that wanted to come, the black house South Africans that wanted to come and and view the tournament and view our play would be able to come without paying a dime because I knew that they did not have uh, the money to pay f to come in there. And also that they would be awarded lunch and all these things were, were, <clears throat> were very happy, made me very happy because I had accomplished something, and I had it did something that I had wanted to do for all of my life, and probably even today I'll think back and look at it that I was a part of a help to abolish a to to help abolish apartheid. Mm -hmm. That's as bad as segregation here yeah. in the United States. Yeah. So as I look back on that, all these things are certainly something that I cherish. And things that I will enjoy the rest of my life, but after after finishing now, on my way back, I stopped off in Lagos, Nigeria, okay. and I won the uh, Lagos championship. Yeah. And I was in the press asked uh, uh, Cliff Roberts if I would be invited to uh, the Masters because all of the other players that had played mm -hmm. and had won was invited to the Masters. He said, Lee Elder is a black America. The South, <laughs> the Lagos, Nigeria championship is for foreign players. And, and that's how they get exempted to come to and play in the United States. So I was not, uh, by me winning, it did not mean that I was going to play at the Masters. Well, then in 1974, you won the Monsanto Open. And that uh, did get you into the Masters. Were you aware of that as you were playing in that event, as you were taking the title, when you sank that last putt, were you aware of the implications that that had on your, your ability to play in the Masters? Yeah, I was aware of it. I was aware of it because uh, the same tournament the year before had gotten the play into the Masters. But what I, uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, I didn't want to jump right to it and, and let the committee know that I was going to accept it and come to the Masters uh, right away. And I had I had sat down and had a conversation conversation with my <clears throat> with my advisors mm -hmm. and my attorney at the time who was handling my business affair and we talked about it. He said, Well I think that what what, what you should do and this is just speaking, you can go about it in any way you like, but I think that you should wait for a while because you don't know what's going to happen. You got you have a whole year before you get back to the Masters next year. You don't know what's going to happen in that uh, in that turn. So I said, "Well, okay, we'll wait and we'll see," which we did. But we only waited for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. As soon as we made contact and talked with Cliff Robert, and he said that 
he had uh, did some things and said some things that he was not proud of. And I think that's what uh, what uh, my attorney wanted was just the fact for him to admit to the things that he had said were were derogatory and uh, we didn't like the way that he went about it. So when he made that statement, I think that pretty much cleared the way for everything to go smoothly and I accepted it. And then when you accepted, you got to play in the Masters, a, a tremendous honor. And, and at that time, I, I, when I was reading about this, I, I was amazed that this is the time you took to set up a scholarship foundation. And I, I want to know how uh, important that was to you to, to set up a scholarship foundation at that time and the lives that it's made a difference in since that point. Well, what happened in that respect was I had received so many threatening letters uh, that you'll never be able to tee off at Augusta that you'll never, <clears throat> you'll never really walk to the first, never walk to the first tee. Uh, you know, when you get receive letters like that, that's pretty frightening. Yeah. You know, so I had to turn it over. But thanks, thanks to the one person that really was interested in that, President Gerald Ford. He, I showed him on several occasions on the letters that I had received, and that I felt that it was. Uh, something that uh, should be looked into. So he felt that if that was going to be the situation that he thought that I should uh, maybe have some kind of protection and maybe go down and s so that nothing would really happen or take place. But what happened was that before that even came about, we had the Secret Service contact me and said, what we would, what we should, what we'll do, is we'll get two houses. So if it's anything that's unpleasant, that is trying to be uh, uh, bestowed upon you, mm -hmm. they will not know which house that you're in. So mm -hmm. that was a big help. It really, it really helped me relax and and really be feel comfortable to the extent that where I could play golf. Of course, it, it, it did not bother me uh, because once I was at the golf course, because I knew that nothing would happen at the golf course amongst all the people that was out there. And plus, if they were going to try to do something as far as shooting me or something of that nature, they weren't going to be able to get the gun into the golf course through the gate unless they did it some in a, in a, different, in a different manner. But it was frightening. It certainly... It certainly made me think about a lot of things, and and really, at at one time I thought about uh, I thought about not playing. I thought about withdrawing, but the reason why I thought about withdrawing two nights, uh, yeah, two nights before before the uh, actual start of the tournament, I had a phone call, and the phone call was from a person that said, "I'll see you tomorrow." before you go through the gate at Augusta National. Well, that was frightening. I didn't know who to call or what to do. I told the Secret Service people, they said, well, that's, don't worry about that. You just go ahead and relax. We, we will take care of that. So those things just kind of really helped me relax and be able to tee off and play the game. I didn't play well. I did the first round, but the second round I was, I think I was, uh, really exhausted from all of the wear and tear and, and the you can't come here and you can't do this and you can't eat here situations that did really got uh, really got uh, pretty tiresome. Yeah, I think people may not realize just how much you went through and had to deal with just to get to that first tee and, and you basically played <laughs> played an entire tournament and then some just to get there and, and that was uh, that's truly inspirational and, and uh, impressive because we know how difficult mentally golf is without all that um, uh, on your plate. So uh, I commend you for that. And I think it's, it's understandable to be exhausted by that second day. Um, I want to move along to, to Ryder Cup. So you played Ryder Cup in 1979. So for me, playing Davis Cup, uh, when you're representing your country, that was the times I got the most nervous. When you hear your game, USA, advantage, you anything, when, it, when you got the, the stars and stripes on your chest, uh, that made me nervous. Was that, uh, <laughs> uh, was that an event that made you nervous at all, or, or we, did that feel like just another, just another round of golf with, with some teammates? Well, that's what I was so proud of, mm -hmm. the fact that I would represent my country. Mm -hmm. 
as as my career as I went down through my career, everybody have asked me, what is the greatest thing that you think have happened to you in your career? I said, it's nothing even close to comparing to the United States Ryder Cup team. Mm. And I tell you the reason why is it that because everybody do not do not get a chance to play on the Ryder Cup team. Mm. Very few are selected for the United States Ryder Cup team. It takes two years to, mm. to qualify for the United States Ryder Cup team. You're not just selected. Uh, well, you're selected if you're one of the two that the captain select. But you have to earn your way onto the Ryder Cup team. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's one of the most rewarding experiences. You know, I had one of the, one of the best captains that uh, I think that you could have. Billy Casper was my captain. We played at, played here in, in White Supper Spring, West Virginia. And it was a magnificent time. And I had probably one of the greatest teams because we won more points than any other team had won at that particular time. Mm -hmm. But I had players like Lee Trevino, Bob Murphy, Lanny Watkins, you know, mm -hmm. guys that had won quite a number of tournaments. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, Andy Beam, who was my plan partners for three events. So I really enjoyed Andy. I had I knew Andy <coughs> from, from playing in his father's tournament in Georgia. So uh, it was just such a... Uh, delightful time to be able to play with him. But I tell you, the, the Ryder Cup team, to stand, to be seated, and have the American flag raised behind you as you, as you ar arise from your chair, it's hard won. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it was no doubt about the, sh the tears did flow because it's something that you, you know, you can, you can only have happen to you the first time. Because then all of the other times are just secondary. Mm -hmm. But that first time is the most important and the most heartwarming uh, time that I think you can have in, in your career of golf. Yeah, that's great to hear that, that that's your, your favorite moment on, uh, on tour is uh, that representation, knowing that uh, the U.S. chose you to be the, the representative for our entire country. That's uh, truly an impressive honor. Uh, moving up to today, uh, 2021, the honorary uh, starter at the Masters. Could you ever thought when you were playing your career that this is where it would lead you to be the honorary starter? No, I really didn't. No, I had no idea. I didn't even know if I was going to <laughs> if I was going to be able to play in the Masters <laughs> and to be honorary starter. Uh, hey, that's uh, uh, unfortunate. A, a, a good a good friend and a person like Arnold Palmer had to pass away for for that to happen. But mm. it's certainly something that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. It's 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 one that I rate right up with the Ryder Cup team. Mm -hmm. I can't say which one is going to be uh, in front of the other one mm -hmm. because they are both great significance to me mm -hmm. and my family and, and the things that we enjoyed while we was at Augusta and the wonderful time that we had at Augusta. I had a magnificent time with the chairman. I, my family had a chance to meet and, 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 and talk with the chairman. So that was very enlightening, you know, yeah. very much so. All of the other people that uh, that was involved with the Augusta National and and bestowing that honor upon me were there, welcomed us. We sat, we chatted with them. We had uh, activities every night after the after all of the festivities was over during the day. But it was just such a wonderful thing to have that happen. I never expected it. I would. I had said many times, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to be on the first tier of the master with the great Jack Nicholson, the great Gary Player. Are you kidding? That's a that's an experience that uh, that only come one time in life, you know. Yeah. And if that could ever happen, I certainly would. But I think the one thing that I have to say is that my hat have to go to Fred Ridley, the chairman for making that move, because there were other times when it could have happened, and mm -hmm. it did not happen. Mm -hmm. L looking back over your career, is there is there a memory of yours that you felt like it, it showed you that you were the right person at the right time uh, to deal with the burden that was bestowed upon you, uh, being uh, the first black golfer to do so many things? As I look back, I think it could have could have happened long before that. Mm -hmm. 
I think we just do not have the right people mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time to to make those things happen and and to go ahead and do the right things by taking those steps. It certainly it was well due, mm -hmm. and 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 I am very happy and proud to see it come about. And I know that it's something that the whole world enjoyed seeing and being a part of mm -hmm. and being during the time that it did come about. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, it's something that uh, Lee Elder will never will never forget mm -hmm. as long as he's on earth. <laughs> and hopefully that the Almighty will will let that be a long time. Yes, we're, we're all hoping for that. Um, you had, you had so many firsts. Was there any pressure when you were dealing with, with so many firsts um, that you were doing something for more than just yourself? Did you feel like you were representing so much more when you were out on the golf course? Well, I have uh, certainly been had the honor of, of receiving so many first things, like you say, and it's hard to put one ahead of the other one mm -hmm. because they're all so significant to me. And I think that as I look back over on it, to try to separate them from one or the other, it, it's, it's pretty hard to do. I keep saying the Ryder Cup, my country, things that I did, you know, serving in the armed services to uh, for my country and to come out and to uh, be able to have a career in the game of golf and to and to work at it and to be rewarded with some wins, some great wins, to be rewarded with some great honors. You know, it's a lot of things that uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of people would like to have, have these particular type of uh, situation happen to them in their career and their, in their lifetime. But I think it's the one thing that I really would like to see, and I must say that, I'd like to see more minorities on the tour. Mm -hmm. We do not have enough out there yet to really compete and, and really compete and show their talent. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I want to continue to strive and work at that. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I have I am still involved in the game of golf. And I am certainly going to work hard and continue to try to help the young minority people that are coming up behind me to see if I can in some kind of way help them because if I do not then I don't know I don't see anyone on the horizon that really uh, have shown that type of interest in it well for one thing we haven't had uh, a, 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 a young black player of any status really create a win anything of significant to make sure that he can go and speak and can speak the right thing to the younger generation when he go in front of them to let them know to work hard and to keep working hard and going in that direction and to stay the cause. That's my, that's my motto on, on, on my education program. You got to stay the cause. Okay. And with the boom from Tiger Woods, did you think there would be more of a rise of, of minority golfers after him? Because I know you said that you haven't seen so many young ones. It's, it's crazy to think that Tiger is definitely no longer one of the young ones. But um, you, I would have expected maybe more players to, to follow in his footsteps. Is that, is that a bit of a surprise to you? Well, you know, Tiger is such a great example for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone to look back on and to want a pattern after the things that he was able to accomplish in his career. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a lot of great work on, on the young generation that, that he have helped that I think will have yet to, to meet that challenge. And I, I think they will meet that challenge. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's just going to take a little time. But again, that's going back to the situation of not having the type of money present that would give them that opportunity yeah the opportunity is and there's no doubt about it money is the one thing that help catapult anyone into the position that they are trying to work at to try to reach you could talk about all the things and all the accolades and all the people 
giving their well wishes. But if you do not have the funds and to continue on in the right direction that you are trying to go, you're not going to reach that point yeah. because it's, it's impossible to reach that point. How are you going to reach it? You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to live. And so these things you have to look back on. And I think that's the one thing that I really kept the minorities down, not being able to get the contract and the sponsorship from the big conglomerates and, and the people that are really putting forth that effort today seem to want to take go with a more established player. I can understand that. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes you have to take a step back and say, let's give the minority generation a chance. Yeah. So I got one, one last question. You've learned so much over your career. Um, I've learned so much just, just spending a little bit of time with you. Do you have any, any advice specifically from what you've learned that you would give to the younger athletes, younger golfers, um, anyone looking to make a difference uh, the way you've made a difference? Well, I certainly would have a, have a lot of things I'd like to say to them. about <clears throat> once you get started in a career going in any, way, any career that you want to go in, you have to realize that you have to kind of take time out to think about what you what you want to do and what you are going to do. And doing something means that you're going to have to stay the course all the way. You have got to say, I'm going to do this to the end, no matter what it takes. I know I said that to myself, but even even throughout the, throughout the career, about midway through the career, I looked, I, I thought to myself, what am I doing this for, you know? But then in the next, in the next thought, you say, well, I made a pledge that I was going to continue this and I was going to stay the course. You have to stay the course and you have to decide that once you get involved in a situation of trying to do something that's going to help other people and also yourself, you have to stay there. You have to work hard at it. You have to, you have to, Forgive and forget a lot of things. And I think that the one thing that a, a young person coming up that want to go that route and get involved in anything, but anything you get involved in, you have to stay at it. You have to set, you have to set challenges for yourself. Not, a, not, a, not challenge, a challenge that's far too recent that you're not going to be able to reach. I don't think that you should set a, a challenge that you can't reach. Because once you reach that challenge, you're very happy that you set that. Mm-hmm. Then next time, sit it a little bit higher. But stay the course mm-hmm. is the one thing that definitely you have to do if you're going to be successful in whatever you undertake. Well, I hope a lot of people listen to that and take that message to heart. I, I want to thank you personally. Uh, I've learned a lot, and, and, and it's an honor to, to be here talking to you. And, and Travis Matthew, thanks you for doing this. So uh, we really appreciate everything you've done for the sport and everything you've done for this world. Lee Elder, thank you. Well, thank you, and it's a great honor. To be involved with Travis Matthew, I will represent you to the highest that I possibly can, and I will set forth a standard, and hopefully that the younger generation that will be coming behind me will do the same. Thank you so very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you.